Okay, welcome everyone. We see people streaming in. We're delighted to have you here today for our last virtual lunch and learn of the fall term. Um, this is number seven and uh, we are delighted to have Jack Hedge here with us today. I'll introduce him in just a moment, but we would love to take your questions. Be sure to put your questions in the Q&A chat bubble if you want me to read them. Everyone is muted and we can't see your video screens in the Zoom webinar format. It's not a Zoom class format. So I will read any question you ask in the Q&A and Jack said he will kindly answer your questions at the end of his presentation. So with that, let's get started. Jack Hedge is the Executive Director of the Utah Inland Port Authority. When he took this position last year, he brought with him 20 years of logistics experience from his work at the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Tacoma. Jack is here today to give us a better idea of how logistics work and Utah's unique position in the goods movement through our nation. Welcome, Jack, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to this group and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the Inland Port Authority and, uh, and the work that we're doing here in, in Utah. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, I came here, I was re recruited from the Port of Los Angeles, where I had spent seven years. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles is the, the primary trade gateway uh, in North America. About a billion dollars a day of uh, U.S. exports and imports flow through that gateway uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it is uh, the largest gateway uh, in North America. And uh, uh, it's, it's vital to the, to the U.S. economic health that our, our trade gateways uh, remain competitive and remain open. Uh, prior to L.A., I was at the Port of Tacoma. Uh, Tacoma we used to joke that Tacoma was, the, um, was really the Port of Chicago uh, because of the direct uh, service to the, to the Midwest from Northern Asia uh, and, and, the, and the vital link that that, that, that plays in our, in our, uh, uh, in our economic uh, livelihood here in North America. Um, so I, I, come to, I come to Utah with a, a fairly good understanding of logistics and goods movement, but I come from two places that have a very strong uh, environmental sustainability uh, creed as part of their, as, as part of their, their, their uh, uh, objectives and their goals and just sort of the, the, the culture of the organizations. And uh, I, I really think that was a, a large, had a lot to do with why I was hired here in Utah. Uh, was to, uh, 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 to try to uh, expand and, and, and promote uh, development of a robust logistics network here in Utah, but do so with an eye toward uh, what's, what's best practice, uh, how do we do so in such a way that we don't uh, uh, continue the, the, the old practices, the mistakes of the past, and we do so in, in a more sustainable uh, and, and environmentally sensitive manner uh, going forward. So I, I do think that's part of the reason why, why I was hired. So a lot of people basically want to know what is an inland port. Well, an inland port is really a, uh, um, uh, a, a logistics uh, connection with a seaport. It really provides that sort of efficiency and um, uh, a goods movement cargo handling efficiency uh, in support of, of those uh, coastal port gateways. And Utah, for all intents and purposes, Utah had an inland port uh, before there was an inland port authority. Uh, the, the Transcontinental Railroad, when it first uh, uh, landed here uh, at, at Promontory and at Ogden uh, and really created the, the, the true Transcontinental Railroad was really linking the markets of the East with the, the ports of the West and, and opening up Asian trade. Uh, and that really was the foundations of what is in effect an inland port. And the fact that that mainline intermodal hub exists here today, and it's within a nine iron of the, uh, of the Salt Lake City International Airport and the uh, interchange between I-80 and I-15, which are the primary cross country uh, interstates in the United States means that this was an inland port really from, from, from that time. 
Um, the fact that there is today about 250 million square feet of warehouse distribution space and truck yards and, and rail yards and all those things that go around moving goods to and through Utah that existed before the Port Authority was created um, speaks to the fact that that inland port really exists today in that location on, on the west side of Salt Lake. What the Port Authority brings is that, that overview, that, that sort of management overview and to, to try to guide development uh, in a way that meets the logistics needs uh, of, of our future economy, uh, of our economy in the next, currently, but also in the next five years, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years out, trying to bring that, that sort of systemic view and that long-term generational view to something that really had kind of grown up organically and, and ad hoc. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to, to, to insert the public good, the public necessity, the public need into what otherwise would be a rail served industrial park uh, that wouldn't have that sort of that overarching public public view. So it really is recognizing that logistics is the lifeblood of our economy and how and the Port Authority bringing in what does that mean in terms of all the different areas that it touches our communities, our, our, our environment, um, the habitat areas that surround uh, the, the Great Salt Lake, uh, and also throughout the state, uh, where, where maybe there hasn't been as much economic opportunity as there has been here on the Wasatch Front. Uh, maybe there hasn't been as much uh, uh, rigor around development and, 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 uh, and promoting sustainability uh, as it has been on the Wasatch Front. It gives us the opportunity to, to do that and position Utah to be a leader in that uh, sustainable logistics goods movement uh, in North America, uh, really for the for the for the future, uh, so it's really a unique opportunity here. Um, you know, the, one of the big things I think too is that there's there is a lot of focus on on this area here of Salt Lake City because, like I said, it kind of is an inland port today. Uh, now, the Port Authority did not take the state did not take away any of the city's rights as to zoning or permitting or land use planning or any of those types of things. What the Port Authority created, what the Port Authority has uh, is the incremental and in, in property tax uh, revenues, a portion of that incremental property tax revenue above a baseline year, which was last year, uh, and use that money to promote this sustainable uh, and smart logistics location uh, out here at Salt Lake City. Those monies can only be used in those ways and in this location. So as we go around out to the state and go out and look at the satellite locations and the network flow of cargo to and through the state, these monies can't be used in those other locations. So we will have to work with local jurisdictions in those areas around the state as we promote this, this idea of this satellite network of, of facilities and operations that really facilitate goods movement to and through the state and try to create economic opportunity, but also a more environmentally sustainable goods movement infrastructure around the state. Uh, so that, that's one of the things I think that, that people need to recognize and understand. So the 250 million square feet of existing office space, or I'm sorry, existing warehouse space that's there today, the current operating environment that's out there today, the, the 15 million square feet of, of planned capacity additions that are out there today, the 5 million square feet or so that are currently entitled and under construction. None of that is coming from the Port Authority. That is coming from the current jurisdictions that retain all of that land use uh, and, and permitting uh, uh, capacity and capability going forward. What the Port Authority will be working with is the, the, the infrastructure that will uh, promote the development and deployment of battery electric vehicles, zero emissions vehicles, and use in those in those areas. Uh, low low impact development um, that that uh, mitigates the effects of stormwater runoff and and and, and those kinds of things. Um, low impact lighting. Um, it's referred to oftentimes as dark sky, but dark sky isn't broad enough. It's more of the impact of lighting on habitat and on, on, on species in those areas, and how do we reduce that, uh, that impact? 
uh, high efficiency building standards, uh, far beyond what, uh, what we think of as LEED certified buildings, beyond that, going beyond that and doing something that is more, even more uh, sustainable than, than LEED certification. Creating those kinds of, those, those, those kinds of levels of, of engagement um, before the Port Authority can, can get involved with, with a project or a facility, those are the kinds of things that we'll be doing uh, and using those, those, uh, those funds for, the, the tax increment for. Um, so, you know, what are some of our, uh, how, how, it, it really is about the Port Authority maximizing kind of that, that economic opportunity around the state, throughout the state, and in particularly off the Wasatch Front, particularly these areas that have been hit hard by changes in, in the marketplace uh, and haven't been able to, to um, um, support the, the, the economic opportunity that, that we've been beneficiary of and also been impacted by here on the Wasatch Front. You know, it's interesting, uh, one of the statistics is about 60, Five or so percent of the state's population lives here uh, in the four county Wasatch Front area, but about 90% of the jobs of the economic activity of the state is here in this area. So that means people are, are, are commuting in every day because there's not economic activity for them uh, where they live. Um, the Port Authority is a way to help start to address that kind of, that kind of activity. And how we're doing that is we're, we've, we've mapped what cargoes flow to and through Utah along those different corridors, I-80, I-15, I-84, I-70, 281, different highways and freeways around the state, as well as the rail infrastructure that we have around the state. And most of that road and rail infrastructure in the Western US flows through Utah. So where you, on this map that you see in front of you, where you see those red lines, which are the railroads and those yellow lines, which is the interstate freeway system. If you'll notice, those things are all converging right here in Utah, right here at, the, at, uh, uh, at this area. So one of the things we're doing, what, it, what that does is that creates a funnel of, of goods movement between our West Coast ports and the big markets of California and the Pacific Northwest and the Midwest, the, the big markets of and manufacturing centers of the Midwest and, 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 and uh, a big distribution markets of the Midwest. We are the funnel. Uh, we are the funnel today. About 23% of all truck miles uh, in the United States flow through Utah. Um, about a third, well over a third of Utah's economic activity, of Utah's jobs, of Utah's taxes, and of Utah's GDP are related to logistics. So it's an absolutely critical piece of our economy. In fact, it is the lifeblood of our economy. And the lifeblood is being constrained in certain parts of the state. So as we move, start to look around the state and look at what these opportunities are, we are mapping those cargo flows, what cargoes move along what corridors through the state, and what assets exist around the state today that we can, that we can utilize, that we can repurpose, that we can reposition, so that we can start to create some value added in the supply chain uh, in these other areas around the state that creates jobs and economic opportunity, reduces cost and inefficiency in the logistics system, the logistics network, and, 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 and benefits all of us around the state. And uh, I, I know we're probably all much more aware of supply chains than we were six months ago, but uh, it, is, it is critically important. If anything, it's sort of shown us uh, how here in Salt Lake and around the state, how fragile our supply chains are. It disrupted our manufacturing economy. It disrupted our consumer economy. And, uh, and so looking for opportunities around the state where people can reshore their businesses, they can bring that, that production back to, to the US, to Utah, uh, we think creates a lot of opportunity uh, throughout the state as, as we start to look around. So what have we done so far? I've been here a year. What have we accomplished in that year? Well, actually, we've, we've, we've actually done quite a bit. 
uh, before I got here, I was employee number one. There was no staff. There was no no. Uh, there was nobody at the port authority, uh, even though the port authority in, in, as an entity existed and a board had been named. There was no staff or entity that could do anything. So upon my arrival, we uh, uh, we began working in earnest uh, on a strategic plan around the port authority, identifying what the opportunities were for for Utah. Uh, in the global logistics system, in the global logistics network, and what were our uh, sort of our, our, our overriding, overarching um, uh, goals for this organization. And, and the board, we, we presented and the board approved a, sustainable, uh, a sustainability goal that, that permeates every strategic as, aspect of the Port Authority. Uh, sustainability really is job one. Um, it is the way to grow our economy in the future. It is the way to attract business to Utah now. Uh, it is what is driving the capital markets. It's what is driving consumer behavior. Uh, and frankly, it's the right thing to do. So we, we, we accomplishing that in, a, in the first year was, was a major milestone for us. As we've moved forward to start to implement that plan, we've signed a number of, of agreements uh, to help promote that that vision for the uh, for Utah and for the Inland Port Authority, um, we signed an agreement with uh, Dominion Energy to develop renewable natural gas, which is gas that escapes from landfills and from other methane sources. We capture that, we put that into the system, and it becomes an alternative fuel, an advanced fuel for for trucking and for use in, in the system. Is it zero emissions? No but it's about 98% of the way there. And it's a huge offset to existing diesel uses in the state that, that we have now from trucking and from, and from goods movement uh, uh, operations. We signed an agreement with Rocky Mountain Power that, uh, that states as a goal that 100% of the electricity uh, uh, consumed in the inland port, by the inland port, will be from renewable resources. That is solar, that is wind, that is geothermal, and it's and, and un, unavailable to us will be sources from uh, 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 traditional generation sources. So that's a big step in terms of decarbonizing the footprint out here and making goods movement and cargo handling in Utah uh, a much a much more sustainable uh, future. And gives place the companies that have that as part of their uh, uh, goal, their objective. Um, promotes Utah as a place where they can come and they can meet their ESG goals uh, uh, here in Utah as, as a place to, to do that. So that's a huge step in that direction. By the way, both of those agreements are statewide in nature. They will cover every Inland Port Authority facility, uh, no matter how big, no matter the location around the state, uh, those two agreements will, will, will help us achieve those goals in, in those areas. Uh, we signed an agreement with National Audubon, uh, National Audubon in, in, in Washington, D.C., to, to protect, to work together jointly to protect and preserve the, the critical habitat areas of the, uh, around the Great Salt Lake. Uh, the city of Salt Lake put in place a natural area zoning on property that, that borders the, uh, the Port Authority boundary. The Port Authority jurisdictional boundary, and we're working with Audubon and the landowners in that area to secure that that uh, that restriction, if you will, in perpetuity, uh, so that that area is protected and provides that buffer uh, for, from now on. The, the that uh, to, to run with the land, we think that's vitally important, and we're very proud of our uh, relationship with Audubon and the work that we're doing there with Audubon. Uh, we've also formed a community advisory committee uh, in response to uh, legislation that we supported with, uh, with Senator Luz Escamilla uh, in last year's session. We've created now that uh, community advisory committee that will work with the communities in and around the Port Authority area, uh, primarily the communities of, of West Salt Lake, um, of, of, of West Valley City, of Magna, those areas that are um, are of, of greatest, at greatest risk and of, of greatest uh, uh, impact from, from the Inland Port, and also, quite frankly, should be the greatest beneficiaries of the Inland Port and what the Inland Port brings in terms of opportunity. And so this, this group is being set up. Uh, we will be working with them to identify what are issues within those neighborhoods 
and how do we address those issues in the neighborhoods? One of the things that we've addressed early on is the fact that there is an awful lot of truck traffic that moves to and through those neighborhoods. And sometimes, especially in the winter, parks in those neighborhoods because it's safe, it's secure, and there's no place for those trucks to go uh, in, 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 in park. There's not enough truck parking. So we've identified that with, with in those neighborhoods, and we are working right now to, to build uh, truck parking uh, areas in the Port Authority area so that truckers have a safe, secure place to park where they can plug in their auxiliary units so they don't have to idle all night long and, uh, and have designated truck routes of how to get there so they're not going through our neighborhoods. So those are some of the things that we can do with our community advisory group and help promote and, 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 and push, push forward as we go forward. So that's some of the milestones that the, that the Port Authority uh, has accomplished so far, but there's a whole lot more to come. So uh, we hope you stay tuned and, uh, and keep watching what we do. Um, so what's, what's next? Um, really going forward, it's really uh, starting to, to create some, some projects, some facilities that are state of the art, that meet these, these goals of providing a more efficient, more, more effective logistics network in support of our, our growing economy, the need to have that, to, to have a, a growing economy. Uh, as our population grows, uh, we have to have a strong economy. The economy either grows or it declines. It's never static, uh, kind of like population. Population either grows or declines. Economy is a function of population. So having a strong economy to, to support our ongoing growth is a necessity. Uh, and, and, and that is really what we are, we are focused on. What that means, we think, what strength means, is that it is sustainable, that it is competitive, that it is rigorous, that we are intentional with what we do, with the decisions that we make and how we promote Utah uh, in, to the rest of the world as a, as a place for uh, manufacturing and, and logistics. Um, so that is, that's kind of our next step, is to really start to put some uh, uh, shovels in the ground, uh, part, start to put some things to work that really start to promote that vision. Uh, that is where we were going, that is what we were, what we were up to and where we're going from here. So I think if, if there's one thing that I want to leave you with, and then we'll start, we can move maybe to questions, um, is what is, is that the Inland Port Authority is not a place. The, the Inland Port, uh, like I said, it exists today. The Port Authority is about bringing forward this idea of, of generational thinking. How do we look to the future? How do we address issues that we have today, but how do we look to the future? How do we do what we need to do to support our economy and support our, 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 our kids and our grandkids growing up in a way that they have good jobs, they have a strong economy, they have a place to, to live and work not just here in the Wasatch Front, but throughout the state. And how do we do it in a way that those jobs, that that, that, those, the, that, that opportunity is protected? And we think the way there is through truly sustainable, truly um, um, smart, intelligent uh, logistics services. And that's really the role and the goal of the Port Authority. So I hope that gives you a good overview of the Port Authority, uh, what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish here in our role. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, to speak and to, uh, to talk through some of these things. Uh, that might have been a little rambling, so uh, some questions might be good to, to, to uh, clear up anything or answer any questions that you might have, and I look forward to answering those questions for you. Okay, Jack, we do have questions. Um, the first one is, you have often said that the inland port will be green. Looking at the acres of warehouses with flat roofs that are already in the area, I'm wondering if you are planning to use warehouse roofs for solar arrays. It seems as though you could generate most of your electricity by that means alone. Yeah, you know, the, that industrial rooftop out there, I mean, if you added that up in terms of acreage, it is a huge opportunity for, for generating solar, uh, solar power, solar, solar energy off those things. So that is part of the discussion we're having with, with Rocky Mountain Power. They are the utility. So they have a lot of the, a lot of the control. 
but uh, I will say that it is a good working relationship with Rocky and they are looking at that with us as a way to help generate the renewable energy that we need, not only for port operations, but then to also disperse into the community, into the grid overall. Um, 250 million square feet growing to probably, you know, almost 300 million square feet of warehouse space in inside the inland port and around that area uh, over time, over the next 10, 10 years or so. It's a huge opportunity to, uh, to turn that into uh, productive area, productive rooftop. So yeah, that is part of the part of the discussion, part of the planning. Well, that's good news. And thank you for the question. And thank yeah, you. For the, answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next one is how about the Freeport Center in Centerville, Davis County? Is that an inland port? And what are the differences? Yeah, so that is a that is an, a rail served industrial park. And that is, um, uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, we are looking at as part of our, our asset mapping. Uh, it's important that we understand what goods are being uh, originated there or coming to there. What's their origin and destination, if you will. Uh, the types of goods, the types of facilities that are there. Is there an opportunity there for the inland port to enhance that, to make that better, to move it, uh, to move goods uh, faster, more efficiently? or add some sustainability aspects to that operation that perhaps don't exist today. So it's one of the assets that we are looking at, one of the areas that we're looking at and considering. Uh, and again, up and down I-15, I-80, uh, I-70, uh, up the I-84, up into Idaho, a lot of different areas like that uh, are the types of things that we're looking for and looking at. Okay, great, thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question is, what does incremental tax differential mean? Not sure I have that term right. I'm not sure I do either, but I'll explain <laughs> it the best I can. So there, a, so there was a baseline year, uh, which I believe was 2019, uh, was, our, was the baseline year. So any, any property tax attributed to the increase in property values above 2019 the Port Authority gets a portion of that. We get 75% of that. 25% of that goes back to the city, Salt Lake City and, and the other, and the other uh, entities. And then out of our, and then, and then in addition to that 25%, another 10% goes to affordable housing. So net net, uh, we get the incremental increase in property taxes above the 2019 level, we get about 65% of that. Uh, and we have to use it for the purposes outlined in our legislation and outlined in our strategic business plan. And you can look at that if you want more, just more detail about some of the specific things that we're working on. Uh, our strategic business plan is on our website at www.inlandportauthority.utah.gov. Uh, and our the executive summary is there. The business plan document itself is there, as well as all the studies and, and things that we did uh, to support that business plan. Okay, that's, that's the best explanation I can give of incremental tax. I'm not that's, aware, so. that's good that we have a resource to go to. Um, thank you for that. Yes. A follow up question to that is who will pay for the additional maintenance of highways necessitated by the increased use by thousands more semi trucks? Well, the increased use of, of semi trucks, the, you know, the, the, the freeways are built to sustain projected traffic flows uh, when, when they are built and the maintenance budgets around those freeways uh, are, are built in. So this project didn't come out of thin air or out of, or out of whole cloth. Uh, this has been on uh, folks radar, whether it be the city, uh, the Wasatch Front, the, uh, the, the UDOT, uh, I've seen stuff going back to the 1970s around this. So the freeways and the freeway interchanges were built with this use, this industrial use in mind, and the and the and the and the growing aspect and need of, of what would be required to, to serve this area in mind at the time. So um, the the any increase in traffic, any increase in uh, um, um, flow has been built into the models uh, going back decades. Okay, thank you. Um, the 
next question is how will wear and tear on the roads be addressed? I'm concerned that taxpayers will put the bill, foot the bill for increased repairs and replacement. Well, roads and roads and uh, road O and M. It's kind of the same question as before. Uh, roadway O and M uh, costs are borne by gas taxes and things like that. They are today. Uh, those are projected into the future. Have been for decades. Uh, and the way that the roads have been built in this state uh, are designed. The freeways and highways, in particular, are designed to uh, heavy uh, those heavy load standards. Uh, Triple axle, you know, triple trailer trucks run up and down those freeways today. Those are the high, the heaviest loads uh, allowed anywhere in the nation uh, run through here today. So those costs are built in there now. Okay, thank you. When will we see in writing the sustainability standards that you will require? Those are on. Those are are ongoing. Those are part of the the development effort that we're going through now. Uh, in terms of our agreements, we're, we've, uh, we're working with city, different departments of the city to create uh, what sustainability uh, standards will, will, will be required in terms of building permits and building requirements and things like that. Uh, that's, uh, we're, we're working with them to develop those and design those. Uh, our own operations, as we develop our own facilities that will be port operated facilities, uh, that's where we'll be creating those and crafting those, and that will be part of our permitting application process and things as we go through those. So those will be embedded in every facility, every project that gets, that gets designed. And different projects in different areas will have different requirements, quite frankly. So those types of things will be, will be required as we design these projects and, and, and move them forward uh, on an individual basis. A lot of it is locational, but uh, those standards will be a part of everything that the Port of Portland Okay, hey, thank you for that answer. Uh, next question is, can you give a description of the process that is used to recycle methane, et cetera, for fuel sources? Yeah, so what they do today, methane in many cases, in many uh, uh, landfills and things like that, is simply vented into the atmosphere. So it is greenhouse gas escaping into the atmosphere today. And that's true of almost every uh, landfill uh, in the nation. What we are working on with Dominion is to capture that, that methane that otherwise is vented in the atmosphere, capture it, um, uh, process it, clean it, if you will, so that it is fuel grade, and then put that into the system, make that available for use uh, as a compressed natural gas uh, commodity uh, for use as fuel. And uh, through the Dominion system, through their pipelines and their, uh, their network of fueling stations around the state, is how we will get that into the, into the system for fuel. We will work with them to identify new locations, particularly within the Inland Port Authority and other jurisdictions as we go around the state to expand the network of those fuel supply systems that compress natural gas infrastructure so that um, trucks that, that, so that we can convert trucks from diesel to, net, to this compressed natural gas uh, and reduce, uh, reduce particulate matter almost to zero um, NOx and SOx uh, by 90 plus percent uh, numbers, uh, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, first of all, from the burning of the diesel fuel in the trucks, but also from reducing and eliminating eventually uh, methane that is vented into the atmosphere. Do you have a time frame on that? Like a goal where that will be accomplished? We will have, I think we will have the first of those, uh, of, of that system being up and, and running and into the, into the, uh, into the system. Um, by end of the year, first part of next year. Okay, so it's not too long term. No, um, no, that's something that we can, that's a fairly low hanging fruit, if you will. Great. Um, along the lines of pollution, uh, please address the logistics of air cargo and the pollution of increased air traffic. Yeah, so the, the, the airport, uh, through the expansion of the airport, there is the opportunity for increased air, co air cargo operations. Uh, what I think most people don't realize is that 80 to 90% of all air cargo is, is in the belly of wide body jets. So it is more of a function of the type of air service that we will attract here to Salt Lake City than it is about scheduled chartered air cargo flights uh, like Polar Air Freight or someone like that. 
um, the vast majority, like I said, 80, 90% is in the belly of wide body jets. So as more and more international flights begin to come into Salt Lake City from Europe, from Asia, uh, from wherever, uh, those wide body jets that are the, the backbone of the international air travel uh, will just by, uh, by default be carrying more air cargo. So I don't think you'll see a huge increase in the number of chartered cargo only flights. It will, it will be a, an organic rise as uh, more and more international flights start to come into, into, into Salt Lake City. Um, and that's, that's really how air cargo functions, how air cargo works. Okay, thank you. Will all of the roof and pavement surfaces create a heat island? Uh, no, the, our, our intention is to, is to set a standard for low impact development that will uh, avoid those types of impacts, those types of abuses. So things like permeable pavements uh, that uh, um, allow stormwater and things like that to percolate through and, and recharge the groundwater uh, and the groundwater system then that flows to the, to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, that pavement doesn't reflect or hold heat the way more traditional types of concretes and things like that do. Uh, also the rooftops. Uh, rooftops today, just by their, by their very nature of just trying to be more energy efficient, rooftops don't hold heat uh, or, or reflect heat. Uh, and to the extent that we can pr pursue what I spoke to earlier, uh, the opportunity to develop solar uh, panels on rooftops uh, reduces that even further and actually captures that and makes, makes use of it. So, uh, we don't foresee that as being as as being a problem. Certainly not to the extent that it was uh, under past building practices. Okay, thank you. Uh, following that is how will you mitigate runoff into groundwater and surrounding wetlands? Yeah, so the the way to do it is is through the the, the use of low impact development techniques. So whether it's permeable pavement that uh, as, a, as the water filters through the pavement, there's an underlayment to that that acts as a filtration system before that water percolates down into the groundwater so that you really are trying to uh, uh, address the groundwater and leave groundwater as, uh, in, in as natural a state and recharge in as natural a way as possible uh, to the extent where that is, is, is uh, effective. Uh, that's, that is a technique that has been used and that we would want to look at using here. But what we are doing is working with the uh, with Salt Lake City and some others to identify what is the best practice for dealing with stormwater runoff, uh, and and in this area that means snow melt as well as you know rainwater runoff, rainwater shooting. What's the best and most effective way to capture that, to treat it, so that it so that it goes back into our into our into our natural areas? Uh, it does not negatively impact those areas. And that is a critical function uh, and something that we are working on closely with uh, Salt Lake City and others. Will it be similar to the parking lot that, that they have at the Natural History Museum up at the University of Utah? Have you seen their parking lot? Yeah, it could, it could very well be. It could very well be. Again, it, it, it gets a little bit location because you have different hydrology out when you're talking about the, the, the area around the Great Salt Lake. You have different hydrology. You have to. You, you need to deal with wetlands issues that are there versus what may be up on the hill, things like that. But yeah, something like that is the kind of thing that we are looking. At. Thank you. Um, getting back to the solar plant panel, someone asks, "What are the plans for dealing with the solar panels that are no longer serviceable? How will they be disposed of?" Or the you know the life cycle on solar panels now the stuff that's being built today is 30 plus years in, in, in life cycle and frankly may may well be extended beyond that with as as the technology gets better and better uh, as they are replaced over time uh, there is a certain amount of damage that that sometimes happens over the years uh, and those replacements and disposal techniques uh, you know I couldn't I, I can't speak to specifically. But I do know that on Port Authority uh, uh, buildings, Port Authority uh, uh, entities or facilities that the Port Authority is funded, uh, we will have to deal with those, uh, any replacement of those types of things in, in the most um, um, conscientious way possible. 
Uh, I don't think just taking them out the landfill and disposing of them is the way to go. To the extent that we can break them down and recycle those materials, we will do so. Uh, and if that means, uh, you know, so that would be our primary focus uh, is, is doing that. How do we recycle the glass that's part of the panels? How do we recycle the photovoltaic cells, the carbon that's in those photovoltaic cells? How do we recycle that the most uh, um, um, uh, conscientious way possible would be our, our, uh, our focus and the way we would deal with it going forward. Okay, thank you. From uh, the, the chat and the questions, I think this group appreciates the, the specific sustainable efforts you're planning to take as the Port Authority, but how do you hold individual companies to those requirements? What control do you have over the companies that are building in the port area? Yeah, so from the Port Authorities, uh, from what we can bring to the table, it's a contractual uh, relationship. If, if what we bring to the table really is the opportunity to, to, to finance uh, or fund or participate in projects. And so our condition of doing so uh, is that you will meet and, 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 and maintain these obligations. So those are contractual obligations that we can, that we will enter into. Uh, or quite frankly, we don't participate. We won't be part of the, we won't be part of the play if, uh, if they don't meet those obligations and stick to those obligations. Okay, thank you. We're gonna go to the money side of things. What is the projected income of the majority of the employees? Okay, yeah. So it's uh, the majority of the jobs that we will be creating in the Inland Port. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk and a lot of concern that they are warehouse jobs, uh, but that is, there's only a limited amount of warehousing that is and will be done in this market. Majority of the jobs are gonna be manufacturing jobs because this, this location, because of the logistics advantages that it has, is, is a prime location for manufacturing, uh, not warehouse distribution. So manufacturing jobs are, are, are higher value, uh, higher paid jobs, and they are more of, of the types of jobs that be created. Those are family wage jobs. And so the vast majority of jobs that will be created because of Port Authority efforts around attracting, building out a logistics system to support manufacturing will be those types of jobs. The warehouse distribution jobs that exist today, quite frankly, those are the jobs that will be uh, transitioning to uh, more of the service and, 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 and facilities jobs around uh, new technologies and deployment of new technologies in and around the area. So for example, a, uh, a diesel mechanic that today might work at a, at a truck stop uh, servicing diesel engines, that, uh, that job is going to be transferred into uh, a, a technician um, with, with a, a skill set around battery electric, uh, electric motors, um, uh, things like that. So that skill level is a level up and the, and the, the earnings um, um, expectations, I think are higher for that kind of job as well. So those are the kinds of things that we will be creating with the Port Authority and with our focus on uh, sustainable um, logistics movement is really moving us toward those types of jobs and away from kind of the traditional warehouse jobs that you saw around warehouse distribution. Thank you for that answer. Question, when you say property taxes, what is the scope of that tax increment? Port property or city, county, state tax base? So it is the property taxes on only on the properties inside the boundary line that was drawn by the legislature. So it is industrial property in the western part of Salt Lake City uh, that was, uh, that is incremental to uh, or above that baseline level. So everything below that baseline level, uh, those property values remains with those taxing entities. Above that taxing level, we share with those taxing entities. Okay, thank you. Um, we've talked about air pollution. Uh, this question says, please address specific plans in light pollution, noise pollution, and air pollution, especially with regard to nearby schools, the new prison, and wildlife. Yeah, so, you know, a big part of our, uh, I mentioned the agreement with uh, our agreement with National Audubon. 
uh, and it is very much to address those issues as they relate to wildlife habitat and, and wildlife areas in and around the, the Port Authority. So um, we have worked with them, not just on uh, the natural area and how to percent, protect and preserve that area and create that buffer. Uh, so stage one is to create the buffer. Um, and it's about a 4,000 acre area buffering the limits of our development and those critical habitat areas around the Great Salt Lake. And frankly, they create some buffer too with some of the neighborhood areas that we've talked about around those areas. In addition to that, we're working with them and others to identify what are the best practices in terms of lighting and light pollution. Uh, we, we know that the traditional sort of high mass light, high mass, high incandescent lights uh, create uh, distractions and light pollution. So going beyond the standard of sort of dark sky lighting, uh, going to the standard of a dark sky lighting product that also is, um, uh, takes habitat and the impacts on, on wildlife into consideration. Those are the kinds of things that we're studying and that we are looking at. Um, quite frankly, the, the, the prison uh, pioneered, has pioneered some of that with their development that they're doing now. Uh, and they, they went to a lighting plan that takes into account some of the, the highest uh, lighting standards anywhere in the world uh, and applied them at the, at the prison. And so we'll be looking at, at how to, you know, implementing that and beyond, what can we take beyond that um, because to, to deal with issues around lighting and light pollution um, in terms of habitat, neighborhoods, that kind of thing. Same kind of thing in, in relation to, to noise pollution, uh, trying to create that buffer between port operations and those neighborhood areas, particularly around schools, uh, noise and, and, and light and air pollution in those neighborhoods. Getting trucks out of those neighborhoods is a huge step in that direction. And, and for us, in the short term, the most immediate benefit we can, we can make to those areas is get those trucks out of those neighborhoods. Um, so working with the city on enforcement, as well as creating an a place for those truckers to go, for those trucks to be, uh, that, that so they don't have to run their, their engines all night long, reduces air pollution, reduces noise, noise pollution. Uh, just getting them out of the neighborhoods is a huge step in that direction. Um, working with the railroads, how do we get the rail, uh, deconflict grade crossings and things like that so we're not idling as much in our neighborhoods uh, and we're not moving the trains as much through the neighborhoods is a, is a huge step in that direction. And we're working on programs with them as well. And then working with the school district around those schools, uh, not just around how do we mitigate impacts around those schools, but how can we work with the school district to create programs uh, in those schools, in those neighborhoods that create benefit uh, for the neighborhoods, for the folks working in the port, for the kids who go to those schools? Uh, what can we do in terms of maybe after school programs and things like that? that can give them some benefit and bring some, some, some value uh, to them as well, uh, over and above just the job creation aspect of things. So there's any number of things that we're working on and really working with this community advisory group that, we, that we're forming uh, will go a long way in helping us identify what those things are, impacts that we can, that we can mitigate and opportunities to, to benefit those communities in those neighborhoods. That'll go a long way in, in, that, in those regards. Okay, thank you. Do you plan to incorporate wetlands and migratory bird pathways into your design? Yes. Yeah, to the extent where we will, as, as, as projects get, get identified, project areas get identified, uh, those existing wetlands and or habitat areas will be um, um, uh, delineated and, and provided for. Uh, in any specific project development plan that we do. So yes, very much so. Okay, thank you. Um, so you mentioned on your website, can we read the agreements with Rocky Mountain Power, Dominion Energy, and the Audubon Society on your website? Yes, those are posted on our website. Okay, I figured you'd say that, thank you. Um, I don't think I understand this question, but it's about the relationship between the city of Salt Lake and its mayor and the inland port. So I guess they want to know the relationship between those. Well, I think we have a, a very good relationship, the lawsuit notwithstanding. I think we have a good relationship. Aaron Mendenhall is, is uh, 
uh, a brilliant leader, uh, someone I'm very proud to, 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 to know and to have a working relationship with. We, uh, during the last session, we actually amended the, uh, the board uh, to give her a direct appointee to the board in addition to the, uh, the, uh, the city council member that is on the board, uh, as well as with Salt Lake County Mayor uh, to give her a direct appointee to the board as well as a county council member to the board. So I think we have a good relationship there as well. In addition to Salt Lake City, don't forget, our, our jurisdictional area covers, uh, touches on county land, as well as Magna Township and the city of West Valley, uh, or West Valley City. So we have representation from those municipalities on our board as well. So this is a multi-jurisdictional area and a multi-jurisdictional uh, relationship with our board, uh, and with those entities around around the around the state, uh, and as we go around the state uh, and and create uh, port authority jurisdictional areas and and other places, uh, we will have similar relationships with those municipalities in those locations as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. There seems to be quite a bit of opposition to the inland port. Why is that? Well, oh, I think for any number of reasons. I think anytime that there's there's a, a perception of a major massive uh, development, it creates uh, concerns, it creates confusion, it creates misapprehension, uh, and 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 I think I think it is totally understandable and completely justifiable. Um, you know, and but I think that's the the role of the port authority is to address those issues and concerns, uh, and I think that's a role that the port authority uniquely can play that perhaps others uh, uh, can't quite as well. Because we have this broad, uh, this broader overarching view, we can take this multi-jurisdictional view and we can take this sort of systems view of things. Um, plus we bring to bear, you know, what we know about lo the logistics industry global, what is being done worldwide, what are best practices, what things are being looked at and investigated and, tr and trying to be understood and always being able to bring those to bear, uh, whether we develop them here at home or we see them somewhere else in the world, uh, bringing that all, all to bear, I think is a, a critically important part of the, of the Port Authority and what we, what we bring. So I think the fears, uh, they're, 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 they're rational, uh, they're justifiable, uh, and our job is to listen to those fears, listen to those concerns, bring about the change needed to, to, to make, to. Uh, uh, so that the, this works for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, is there an estimate of how much of an increase in water usage this facility will require? Yeah, typically water is not a huge impact. Water usage is not a huge impact from these types of industrial facilities. We're not, even when we're talking about manufacturing, uh, we're talking about more, um, uh, things like uh, auto parts, uh, consumer products, consumer goods, um, uh, outdoor equipment, uh, that kind of thing. Not, not big water users in terms of the manufacturing of those types of, of products and goods. Uh, warehouse distribution uses very little. Uh, basically you have your, your, your kitchen and bathroom requirements for, your, for the, the people who work in the building. Uh, so not big water usage, um, uh, incrementally from this type of industrial development. Okay, thank you. We have one last question before we let you get back to your busy day. Um, do you know what the BTU content of landfill gas is? I know that per, um, you know, per kilogram, it is very much comparable to, uh, to natural gas, to regular natural gas. Uh, it is so it is a viable alternate fuel to the sort of typical natural gas that's used as, a, as an alternative fuel to diesel. Um, so it would meet the, the, the specs that would be needed to operate equipment, to operate trucks, uh, things like that. It would have that BTU content, but because, uh, because it's capture of existing escaping greenhouse gas, um, you get the added benefit over, over the normal natural gas in terms of the combustion. You get that, you get the same sort of combustion footprint that you get from the regular natural gas, 
but you get the added benefit of extracting that uh, methane from the atmosphere, uh, and you don't have the 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 for lack of a better term the the impacts of the typical sort of drilling and production uh, activity that you have in a in a typical natural gas well. So uh, the net benefit of capturing uh, methane from these types of sources uh, is typically exceeds the, the, what you typically see in natural gas. Okay, maybe we have time for one more. Someone snuck in. Uh, one, I think, what type of manufacturing do you envision? Yeah, I think uh, the, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, the, the types of companies that, that need and require uh, really uh, highly efficient, highly effective uh, logistics are the types of manufacturers that will come here. So the just-in-time manufacturing market around medical devices, around auto parts, around aircraft parts, aerospace parts, uh, those types of things that already have a bit of a presence here uh, in Utah. Uh, well, those types of companies that are really looking at this area and really seeing an advantage to being in this area. From a consumer goods standpoint, it really is around um, uh, outdoor equipment, sporting goods, that type of thing, which again, we have those industries here in Utah now. It's about growing and expanding those, 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 those pies uh, so that there's, there's, there's a bigger pie uh, to go around. Uh, I think those are the kinds of companies typically that you would see, uh, that, that we see uh, looking at this area and expressing interest in these, in these areas around the state. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jack thank Hedge, you. for joining our Lunch and Learn today. We learned a lot. Good. And we appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to spend with us and answer our questions, especially. We're glad to do it. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for, for being here and for participating. And um, um, look forward to doing this again sometime. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a good day. And thanks, thank everyone, you. for joining. Apparently, we had a problem with the password, so people came a little bit late, so our apologies for that. And we will work that out for next time, so thank you for joining us.